Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today, I'm sharing with you a conversation I had with Elizabeth Copeland and Hallie Williams about a short film recently written and produced by Elizabeth and now marketed by Hallie called Honoring Choices. And it's an excellent tool to use to encourage conversations around the end of life, especially for the diverse communities that we're trying to reach out to in order to end some of the healthcare disparities that exist in end of life care. So take a listen. It's a great conversation. You'll learn all about the film, how to access it for screenings and how it could be helpful in your own community. If you enjoy this, this podcast and this channel, be sure and recommend it to others. Also, be sure to subscribe down below if you haven't already, and subscribe and leave a rating and review for the podcast wherever you happen to listen. If you'd like to offer a little bit of support financially, you can go to eoluniversity.com slash support and find out how you can make just a small donation and help us keep this channel and the podcast on the air. So thanks in advance for all of you who choose to do that. And here we go with the interview. Today, I'm so very excited to have two special guests on the podcast, Elizabeth Copeland and, and Hallie Williams. Elizabeth has been a guest before. Back in 2020 on Mother's Day, we did an episode on her grief dialogues, talking about grief stories for motherless daughters on, on Mother's Day. And I will leave a link in the show notes to that episode because you should really go back and listen to it to get a feel for the whole breadth of work that Elizabeth is doing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about her. She is a 40-year marketing and public relations veteran who turned her personal loss and grief into the groundbreaking play, Grief Dialogues, and built the nonprofit Grief Dialogues a theatrical movement to create new conversations about dying, death, and grief. Elizabeth is also the Out of Grief Comes Art podcast creator and co-host and the executive producer of 8 a.m., a short film on traumatic loss. She also created the stage play Honoring Choices, which in 2022 expanded into the development of a film, Honoring Choices, the film, which is now available for licensing and is an official selection of the Legacy Film Festival on Aging presentation in 2023. And we're going to talk all about Honoring Choices today. You can learn more about the film at Elizabeth's website, griefdialogues.com. Hallie is a digital brand strategist, serves passionately as the marketing director of Grief Dialogues, and speaks as one of the hosts on the Out of Grief Comes Art podcast. While serving as a social media maven and marketer for years prior with Grief Dialogues, her involvement felt all the more important with the recent and sudden passing of her father in 2022, and Hallie feeling that loss with you. Hallie is now on a mission to emphasize the importance of end-of-life pre-planning and encourage younger demographics to explore death conversations. Forever and always an artist and musician at heart, Hallie eagerly seeks out creators who have used art to help them heal. So welcome, Elizabeth and Hallie. Hi, thank, thank you. you so much. We had the, the privilege and fun of having lunch together when you were both in Los Angeles, oh gosh, a month or so ago, maybe two months ago. Um, and with the September, yeah. Yeah, for the film Honoring Choices for the Los Angeles premiere, which was amazing. And it was so wonderful to get to meet both of you in person yeah. then. And it's so like the best pesto sandwich I'd ever had. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it was, it was, the food was great. The conversation was amazing. The whole thing yeah. was really, uh, was magical that day. And so Ooh. this podcast mm -hmm. episode grew out of that lunch when we just decided we have to talk more and do this together. So I'm so glad that you were both able to find time because I know you're both very busy in what you're doing. But I wanted to focus in today on Honoring Choices, the film, because it's just so important. And I really want people to know about it. And it's new. So I, I want to shed some light on it and encourage people to take a look and figure out how they might get involved with it. So Elizabeth, maybe you could talk a little bit about Honoring Choices, what inspired you I know why I know you created the film because the demand for the play was so great, but what inspired you to write the whole the whole thing in the first place? Right. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Thanks having for having us on in your show today. Uh, 
so back in 2019, which seems like a century ago these days, I was commissioned by Honoring Choices Pacific Northwest, which is a nonprofit up here in the Seattle area, to write a play that addressed advanced care directives. And uh, it was meant to be a story, and they wanted to use it as basically their keynote for their conference that they were holding in February of 2020. And so instead of having a speaker get up and tell a story and then talk about helping physicians and hospital administrators and so forth to get their patients to do advanced care directives, they decided, wouldn't it be a fun idea to have a play and have this, you know, acted out in front of the conference attendees. And Which then is a brilliant it. idea, it's actually. Really it's smart. brilliant. It's really yeah. smart. Um, and so, so they, so Bonnie Bazell, who was with Honoring Choices Pacific Northwest at the time, commissioned me to write the story, to write the play. And it was, it was a fun thing to write because it is loosely based on a, my personal story with my own father, but it, it's the story of an elderly man who receives a terminal diagnosis and his two adult daughters and the doctor. And so we performed it live at the conference. In, I think it was like February 23rd of 2020, and it was extremely well received. And we all, uh, people started reaching out and, and actually Ford Hospital in Detroit was interested in doing it and Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle and so forth. And of course the plan was set that we'd start doing this show across, you know, basically across the country. And then we all know what happened in March of 2020. And so all live theater just came crashing down, not, not too, not to be done for a while but even then we all kind of thought oh by the fall it'll be fine you know and obviously it was not but but the beauty of this particular play where was that these kinds of conversations between patients and caregivers and doctors and nurses and so forth these conversations were being held on zoom for real so we pivoted the play into a live Zoom production on Zoom. Uh, again, not having to adapt because people were really having these, these very difficult conversations on Zoom. And we then performed in the remainder of 2020 and in 2021, we had the original cast, we had an all African-American cast and we had a Latino cast. And that, that particular script was done in Spanish. And it was extremely, again, well-received. We did a lot of these shows. And then I started getting, at the end of 2021, started getting other requests for the play again. Well, it's, it's a lot of work, even on Zoom, to do a live production. And I've always been adamant about paying everyone equity rates and, and playing tech properly and so forth. And so someone gave me the idea, why don't you do a film and why don't you do a film with the cast that is most requested, which happened to be all our all African American cast. So I was going to be in New York in um, April of 2022, and we put a cast together and a crew, and we we filmed the film in three days in three different locations. And I'm very I'm very proud of the creative endeavors of everyone involved in this in this film it's so, really amazing that that the play first of all was so adaptable that you could just move it onto zoom where it seems to me what great modeling you did for people who were trying to figure out how do yeah. we talk to each other when we're not when we can't be in the same room how do we talk right. about difficult challenging things and to have this play be so instructive to people that it's mm. possible you can do it you can have right. challenging conversations without being being physically together, though it's far preferable to do that. But then to right. be able to to adapt it to different um, races and ethnicities, and now into a film, it's it's really right. amazing that you've created it. Um, so um, let's see. Tell us more. I know you mentioned it was based. the The true story is that it's based on your experience with your own father. If you want to tell right. us a little more about that. Sure. Yes. It's based on um, my own father who received a terminal diagnosis of esophageal cancer in, um, in September of 96. And my sister and I, uh, ma mainly my sister being involved in his care and his end of life 
decisions and the fact that he did get a stroke or have a stroke due to the chemo and a lot of the story elements that you see in the film actually happened, including the fact that uh, he just sort of randomly during chemo one day talked about he always wanted to be an astronaut. And that was something we didn't know about our father. There's a lot of things that came out during that time uh, that we didn't know about our father that he shared. And, and there's a line in the, in the play and the film that says, you know, uh, one sister says, well, that was random. And, and uh, the younger sister says, everything is random when you're waiting for chemo. And I've had a lot of people say to me, oh my gosh, that's exactly how it feels. So, so that is, so it's based on that story. The, the uh, difference, however, is in the end, we didn't have an opportunity to talk to him about what he wanted at the end of life. So as Hallie will jump in, I'm sure, and say, out of grief comes art. Um, I was able to write a different ending to both the play and the film, an ending I, I would have loved to have had that we didn't get to have. So I was able to take the story and its message and change the ending that gave me a little bit more um, sort of solace in, in my own personal grief. Mm, beautiful. And I, and do I just want to add... Oh, <laughs> I, I would just add too that if, when you see the pictures, any of the pictures which happen to be on our website or whatever, Bob, the the elderly father, is wearing a blue plaid shirt in um, a number of the scenes, and that was my dad's shirt, so it was it was oh. special. Oh, that's really sweet. Uh, Hallie, anything that you want to add <laughs> to that? Oh, I I I love that. Um, I I mean I've. I've been working on this project with Elizabeth for a while now, but I love when in, in the film, how she was able to write a little bit of a different ending um, than perhaps her own, but it was, is very comforting and hopeful and inspiring to me as I just went through my own grief with my father. And ironically um, how this film kind of plays out is very similar to my experience just in February with my father um you know there are some technical differences right like my father um, had a different illness and a different you know diagnosis and his was a little more sudden and just you know there, there's differences but the overall tone of um having that family dynamic between you know sisters and and trying to communicate with your father and really trying to figure out what he wants in those final stages is a big theme in the film. And, and that was very real in my life. So hmm. it's so true. I wanted to mention that it's a short film, but you have packed so much into the film. Like you're talking about those family dynamics come through really clearly and you don't have to dwell on it for a long time <laughs> explaining yeah. the family dynamics it's obvious it plays out before our eyes and that's something really skillful about the film oh thank you well I will give a shout out to two of my uh, playwriting teachers Gary Garrison and James Anthony Tyler who taught me the basics on how to write a really good play and it is hard to write it in a short period of time but whether it's an hour and 20 minutes or 12 minutes, you still have to have a beginning, middle and end that's satisfying. So um, I, I guess it's a craft, but I learned from the best. <laughs> and I just wanted to say, it seems like this day and age, there's a value to having a shorter film, like people's yes. attention spans are shorter and oh, people don't right. have time to devote to longer things. Right, right. And and we want to also have the opportunity for whoever is moderating, if it's a community event or whatever, to spend time talking about, one, what, what they just saw, and two, how they might be able to talk with their own family or deal with an obstinate you know, elderly parent who doesn't want to talk about it. And so the film isn't, is, it's a story, but it's meant to stimulate the conversation and get that conversation going. So it's, it's just it's the, the opening dialogue, if you will. And then the rest is up to the group who wants to talk about what, what you do next. Yeah. Yeah. And Hallie, I know on the website, it talks about kind of the deeper purposes of the film and the intentions for yeah. it. If you would yes. um, tell our listeners about, about that. Oh, absolutely. And this is the part where I'm really passionate about. Um, it's, it's really about starting a conversation with your family and loved ones. Um, grief dialogues as a whole if we just kind of zoom out, our whole mission is to generate that conversation about grief and dying and death. And, you know, we recognize that 
death is something that nobody really wants to talk about, but it is the one thing that is guaranteed in this life. And how ironic is that? So um, we do a disservice to ourselves by not pausing and maybe in the earlier stages of your family dynamic saying, hey, you know, one day I am going to pass away. And when that time comes, here's what we're going to do as a family, or here's what I would like, or here, you know, do you guys have any thoughts? And, and it's, it's weird because we don't like to talk about it, but it's important. Um, going back to the grief I just went through, my family never talked about death and dying and grief. Um, I come from an African-American family. And then all of a sudden, as my dad was about to pass away, like literally the last few words on his deathbed, I think we were at the two day mark, three day mark. Um, and he could barely speak. He found all of his strength to sit up and tell me his wishes, his end of life wishes. And I'm the oldest daughter. And so I was also power of attorney and I have little baby boys and a family and just the whole life going on. And he, he kind of hit me with this big request that number one was over. So he wanted to be buried with his bass guitar and the bass guitar strap in his mother's grave. With his wow. Mother. And I wow. <laughs> was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Be because <laughs> I'm finding out all this information like in the moment. And unfortunately, it also came started to come down to like the technical financial aspects of things, which I was as a power of attorney, I was already trying to be good about, you know, get the paperwork in, do all the do all the checklisty things while grieving and watching dad pass. And then all of a sudden he hit me with this. And I just felt, I remember I just went to the hallway and cried with my husband mm -hmm. because I was so overwhelmed because of course I want to honor dad and give him what he wants. But also that bill financially, I'm like not in a place with, with toddlers to, to like drop our, you know, dip into our savings and right. So then there's that. And then also most importantly, where the heck is the bass guitar, dad? Is it like, you know, yeah. is it in your storage unit? Is it in your apartment? Like I have no idea, like, right. And so all those factors put together circles us back to, it's really important to have conversations and that way you can honor people as they need to be honored as, yeah. or as they would wish. Right? And isn't it interesting that sometimes people who don't think they would have any preferences for the yeah. end of life or for where they die or how they're buried. They, in advance, they don't think it matters to them, but it might like with your father at the very end, they may, they may think of something that's amazing and would be incredible. But if, if they, if plan he, for a little, like, I'm you, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, plan, planning ahead actually makes things like that possible if you have time to work on it and figure it out. But at the last minute, it's so, so very hard to, to bring that about. And then you add in the layers of family dynamics. My, my younger sister, of course, was there and she, you know, just kind of like in our film, um, there's the really orderly sister who's very on it. And then there's the other sister who might be a little more compassionate, right? And I've always been called the cold one between the two of us because I'm just like, you know, think like pantsuit legal. Like, okay, give me a list. <laughs> Let's do it, right? And my sister is more of the loving and, you know, so I remember dad saying this and her sitting there on the side of his bed and she's like, we'll do everything we can. And I know she was speaking from the heart and, you know, sitting at his bedside. And I, I mean, that, that statement almost sent me to tears because I was like, what do you mean we're going to do everything we can? Hold on. <laughs> like, you know, like I'm panicking. So um, we try to capture that in the film. Obviously, Elizabeth didn't write it for me. But when I go back and watch it now, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a very real dynamic that I think happens in a lot of families. Yeah, it's interesting that the story and honoring choices ended up reflecting both of your true yeah. life situations, um, which is that that's really beautiful and how perfect. I mean, you're you're a great team working together oh, yeah. as well. <laughs> and I, I really had no creative input on this. I just I mean, Elizabeth is really so genuinely, truly talented. Um, but I think her it really speaks to her talent because here we are, she, she wrote this years ago and look how much it matches up to my, I mean, it matches to my personal story. So 
ironically, she didn't write it for me. I mean, she wrote it for everyone, but she didn't, she didn't write it for me. She didn't think, oh, this is what's going to, she wasn't a fortune teller. This is what, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I so. guess that just shows how universal these situations are. And Helly, you mentioned the fact that you come from an, an African-American family. And we know I was just reading a study recently that only 15% of older black Americans have completed an advanced directive compared with 52% of older whites. And so that seems like a huge issue. The fact that the film is, or the play was most requested with the African-American cast makes me, gives me hope and makes me think that maybe the tides are shifting there, but I don't know. What, what are your thoughts about that, Holly? Yeah. I mean, I will say as a black woman and a mixed woman, so my family is, my, my family is black and white. Um, I would say definitely the African-American community is resistant to, and I want to say end of life planning. I don't think it's that we don't want to plan. I think that we don't trust the medical system. I would also, I'm not um, Hispanic, but I would, I would timidly raise my hand and represent that them in that category as well. Um, we come from a lineage where the medical system and a lot of systems in America just can't be trusted. They don't have our best interests in mind. So when you are then faced with mom dying or dad dying or grandma, grandpa, you know, someone dying and you need help and you consistently have never had reliant help from, from these systems, it's kind of like the last place you want to go. And especially with something that's so fragile and so important, um, we tend to, we tend to turn a lot to the church. We tend to stay within our walls. And while there's many things I could deep dive into that, I still think it goes back to, it's very important to encourage the conversation sooner than later. It's really hard, regardless your race, to all of a sudden have to try to make really big decisions when you're really emotional. And what's the number one rule that we teach our kids? Don't make big decisions when you're crying or, you know, right? Like, and here you are. And it's like, oh, this is a really big decision. And we're really emotional. So let's try to shift that habit and and start having death and dying conversations sooner so that way we're not so caught off guard and whoever has to become captain of the ship kind of has an idea of where they're pointing the ship at least if that I hope that answered your question a little bit yeah and i i like i love the fact that one of the stories you have to tell about your father is the bass guitar that he wanted to be buried with because that doesn't require trust in the medical system but it does require having conversations in advance for those special things special meaningful moments that we would like to have um at the time of death and after death. And so I think that's a really good point, regardless of what people, how people feel about the medical system or whether they trust it or not. There are many other, excuse me, many other issues to be addressed around end of life choices. And Elizabeth, anything you wanted to add to that? Well, I did, I did want to add um, that the National Association of African American Mayors did make advanced preparing advanced care directors a priority in, I believe it was in 2019 or it might've been 2020. Of course the pandemic hit and everything got pushed out, but it is a priority among a lot of organizations and a lot of um, cities that are, you know, as I mentioned, African-American mayors. Um, Pastor Corey Kennard, who's one of our great supporters and actually co-moderate, he's terrific. He is um, out of Detroit. And he and Hallie co-presented when we debuted the film in Los Angeles in the end of September with Reimagine. But um, additionally, he's actually taking the film, uh, see today's Wednesday, tomorrow he's presenting with the Hospice of New York and is talking about working on advanced care directors with specifically with the African-American community. So these conversations are starting to happen, which is very encouraging. And there's, um, I'm just, so honored that they are taking our film, that Corey's taking our film to use it as the impetus to start these conversations. And in fact, um, when I talked to Corey yesterday, uh, he wants us to come in April. April 16th is an advanced care directive day. If you can, there's a day for everything, right? But mm -hmm. but at least it you know, gives us a reason to start talking about 
about this specifically, but he wants to do a whole program launch in Detroit around mm -hmm. the film, using the film, and he wants us to be there for that. So, so um, it's really, yes, we, we did it. We did this particular film because that was the request we were getting, but it was definitely coming on the heels of people saying, we need to talk about this. You know, we need to talk about this. And something as simple as who do you want to make your, the decisions for you if you can't? Um, and that is actually one of the, that's the first question in the film, but I think it's the first question any of us should be asking whether or not we trust the system or not. Who do we trust to help us when we can't speak for ourselves? And if nothing else, at the end of the film, if people get them, you know, maybe I better, I better, and it's not always who you think it should be. Um, I've and even been change it. And you can change it, but yeah. also sometimes you think, oh, it should be my husband, it should be my wife. Well, sometimes in very tragic situations in particular, that person is so distraught, they're not the right one to make the decision. And so we don't always think about that. So, so just making that one little uh, choice as to who will speak for you is huge. And if that's all we get uh, after people see the film and talk about it, if they walk out going, okay, here's the person I want to do it, then we feel we've been hugely successful. And that's great. And, and I, I, go ahead, Holly. Oh, I, everything Elizabeth just said is spot on. And, and I also just want to jump in and add in the African community, African American community specifically, I don't know necessarily if it's that they don't want to talk about it. I think that that, that statement right there probably isn't true and make some people mad. They'd be like, well, hold on. I, it's not that we don't want to talk about it. It's that how our families work and just the culture and liveliness. I think there's a, there's a lot of dynamics where you don't want to ruffle feathers and, and, and we're so vocal and passionate that it's, that it can like, if we talk about it too soon, it's going to become some, it's going to become a big, a, a, a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think for everything Elizabeth said, but then she said, you know, if they, if they just walk away, at least thinking, who could I pick? Well, for me, it's a little bit more like, how can we start approaching this? Because in my mind, in my family, like I have, I've got a couple of people in my mind. I'm like, this person, because okay, okay. You know, but for my dynamic in our family, it's more like, how am I going to bring up the conversation without making this a to-do? Like I'm in my late twenties. I don't want to spend the next 60 years or however long having some fight about who's going to, you know, handle mom stuff because both of my sons are competitive and think you know, like, I don't, I don't, that's not the priority. It's about like, how am I going to roll this out? And I think that if we can just get people to start thinking about their unique situations, that is a big win for me at least. That, that's such a good point. I never thought of before Hallie that there is timing is important and that sometimes just picking a healthcare proxy, as you said, might set off a huge conflict in the family because others may not agree with your choice or may feel hurt that they weren't chosen. And you have a lot of, a lot of emotion to get through just in making that choice. So I understand what you're saying. The timing really matters. And, um, I, but, but that's I, why. Oh, I, I was going to add to that. That's why the moderation is so important because um, learning how, because, you know, this doesn't have to be a big thing. If you, if, if it's not going to be someone who's obvious, like a spouse, um, letting that, that person know why you would like them to be your, your uh, agent, healthcare agent, um, and making sure that they're on board with that. Uh, don't let it don't let it be a surprise. You got hit by a car and all of a sudden they find out that you name them, right? So just those simple things. So that's why when we do this film, um, yes, this the simplicity is having someone in mind, especially yeah. if it's not someone who is the logical choice. And then in the just you know, hopefully people will say, okay, but my family, you know, my mother-in-law is gonna get really pissed that I chose my father-in-law, blah, blah. blah. So how do I handle that? And that's why that's why one of the reasons why we want to keep the film short is so people can then ask these specific questions mm -hmm. on how do I handle a difficult situation. Um, so, so yes, it's it's not as simple as just that, but just having somebody in mind is um, is you know really important. But what people don't realize, I think, and that's why I would I don't want to make it sound too simple, but that it really isn't this huge. Uh, 
dis necessarily dis doesn't have to be a huge discovery. It's like anything else, bit by bit, piece by piece, measure by measure. And that's why I wanted to focus in on the healthcare agent because it's one small part that can make a ginormous uh, it, it, uh, difference, but it doesn't have to, you have to sit down and write your whole will and who's gonna get the kids and uh, that's good to know, but that's not necessarily what we're advocating to be your first step. So true. And everyone 18 and over should actually have thought about that and even have named an agent, even though that might change many, many times throughout yeah, life over and over. because we, we all need to have that. And I thought of that's actually a great rationale. If you don't feel trust in the medical system, all the more reason have a person you do trust who will look out for you with the medical system and look out for your best interests. Like all the more reason to know somebody's got your back, who's going to be there watching out and making sure the medical system doesn't treat you badly. You right, it. exactly. And speak up for you. You know, um, you know, my husband is my healthcare agent, and I know he will speak up. But for some reason, he's not available or no longer alive. I have two sons. One of them, I would definitely want to be my healthcare agent. The <laughs> other one will be a puddle. He will be a puddle. And I don't care if I'm 110. He will be a puddle because that's just who he is emotionally. And I love him dearly for that. I love him dearly for that. But I want the other one to be my healthcare agent because he will fight to get me the right care. So these are the things you uh, and Hallie knows which ones. I, I know, about. I know her, I know her children. So I'm like, oh yeah. Um, so, so those are the kinds of things that open discussions that, that we hope this film, that's what this, this film is all about, opening that discussion, that dialogue. Yeah. And it's an, it's a really, it is a really interesting thing to think about. I, it just made me remember, I have one older brother and when my mom was filling out her advanced directive, um, she, he, she felt he's the oldest child. So he should be my proxy. Isn't that what you naturally do? But I'm a doctor. So maybe, you know, that kind of makes sense. And she just ended up talking to my brother, like, would you be comfortable making decisions about my health care and talking to the doctors and everything if I needed that? And he said, no way. I don't want anything to do with that. And then she said, oh, well, should I ask? Karen then and he said yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. ask her it was like oh right. it made it simple because he really didn't want anything to do with it once and, he knew what like, it involved that right there also shows why the conversation is important because mm -hmm. as much as when at the end of your life it's about you also there's people who are preceding you and they might not be comfortable having to be that person and it, I would rather thinking about it I'd rather kind of know if let's just say I was selecting a son and he's like no thank you I like oh okay I also want to honor you too and I don't want you having to have all this face with this and you're all stressed out about it like right so yeah yeah mm -hmm. well I wanted to talk a little bit Elizabeth as a playwright I know you're, you're familiar because you see it before your eyes all the time with the power of telling stories like we could go out there and hold workshops all day long and tell people statistics and here's what you do fill out this form answer these questions and it will have very little impact but telling a story like your film does changes everything and so uh, talk to us a little bit about this power of stories yes. Yes, there's actually, it's called the neuroscience of storytelling. And I'll even I'll send you a link. They've actually now started to do real hard facts, uh, research around the fact that people, their whole attitude shifts, their decision-making process shifts when you tell them a story as opposed to giving them numbers or facts or lectures. And um, I, nothing, I mean, st and storytelling, straight out storytelling is great. But personally, one of the reasons why we did theater and film is because theater is really the ultimate empathy generator. And by sitting in an audience, whether you're watching a play, which actually is my preference, but whether you're watching a play or a film, you are, you are seeing someone else's story and you can either relate to that story specifically, or you can understand it from the uh, character's point of view, but it gives you a whole different understanding than just being told about it. So, um, and the reason I, I also wanted to bring that up was the, the power of story. And I have some statistics that I can, I can share with you as well. But the, um, when we first started doing, when we first started writing plays about dying, death and grief, 
and they would be performed. I, I would often attend the performances. In fact, we had a, a run of my play, Hospice, The Love Story, which is a one act. And it, it ran in Los Angeles for six weeks at the Group Rep Theater in North Hollywood. And so I attended these shows, the opening weekend and the closing weekend. And what was interesting was oftentimes the, the, uh, the, the producer would get up before each, each show and he would announce that I was in the audience. And people would come up to me afterwards and invariably they'd say things like, wow, that was a really great play. You know, something like that happened to me when my mother died. And then for the next 15 minutes, they told me their story. And I, that's when I realized that it wasn't my story. It was the power that my story and the permission my story gave to others to share theirs. And the one line that I got over and over and over again and do to this day is, I thought I was the only one who felt that way. Mm. But after seeing it in the film, after seeing it on stage, I realized it's a lot of people who, who experienced that. And that is, as a, as a playwright, um, and, that, and now a screenwriter, uh, that was just meant all the world to me, that people want to share their stories once they hear these these stories and even uh, when we were in Lamert Park what I loved uh, it was a predominantly African-American group and what was so much fun about that was the the people after after they saw the film wanting to share their own stories about how their dad didn't have an advanced care plan but uh, and it was grueling and and uh, they felt they weren't honoring his wishes but after he died they said something to their mother about, we need to make one. And she was like, oh, I did that years ago. I'll find it for you, you know? And it's sometimes it's just kind of these funny stories that pop up and you don't realize that maybe somebody has thought about it. You just never asked, you know? Um, so anyway, that's the, the power of theater and the power of storytelling is just amazing. It, it makes sense that we're wired for stories. I mean, humans have been telling stories around campfires since, since the exactly. dawn of time. And, and so it makes sense that our brains respond to that and we see the pictures in our own minds, but it, the power right. of it, but I was also thinking of the importance of representation and that, so the fact that your film has an African-American cast, but, but you've written it so that this, this script or the play at least is adapted for any cast because I think it's I think we need to be able to see ourselves within the characters that oh, we're so watching true. absolutely absolutely and you know quite frankly when I wrote the original script um, we just cast it with the best actors who were available and it turned out it was a, a white man and two white daughters and an African-American doctor those are the characters and that just that's just the way the cast played out yeah. um, and so so then when I was requested to do the African-American cast, I, I have to say, I was a little nervous. It was like, you know, I'm a white woman. I don't want to pretend like somehow I know how this should play out in an African-American household. So one of the actresses that, that we had cast, I asked her if she would go over the script with me and help me to adjust any wording. And she did say, you know, this, these kinds of conversations are universal. I'm going to recommend a couple of word changes but basically, if you allow your actors to bring with them how they would say the, the words or how they would, you know, add a phrase here or there, or even the body language, you know, how they, their physical acting would look so that they can bring the ethnicity or the culture or whatever they can, you, you know, you're giving them permission. And quite frankly, in a lot of plays and a lot of um, films you know the the screenwriter the director the producer they don't necessarily want you to mess with the words or how it's presented to the actors but with with us both uh, the african-american version and the hispanic version we gave them carte blanche you perform it the way you would be talking to your own family and literally as far as the actual script goes only a few words changed but if you could ever see you know, the one Caucasian version versus the African American, you would immediately notice the difference in a in a wonderfully culturally rich way. And I'm just I'm just so proud of of um, not, I mean I'm proud of my own writing, but I'm more proud of what the actors have brought to the show. And we just did the New York debut, which which was really a party and celebration of the actors. Um, and they loved doing this film. They said to me. I just feel like I made such a difference that people are going to look at this and, and, you know, want 
to do something with their own advanced care directors or their own end of life plan. Um, and they got paid, but they said that the best part was knowing that they're part of something bigger. Oh. That, that's, that's just so beautiful. And I know when the three of us met along with Lisa, the amazing Lisa Paul from oh, the death hi, deck, uh, <laughs> our, our favorite person, I think everyone yeah. who meets her. <laughs> <laughs> um we you had just you had just come off of premiering the film at I think was it the Reimagine Festival maybe tell us more about that and tell us about Lemert Park because I wasn't familiar with that area Hallie and what and the significance of that oh my gosh well okay so uh Re Reimagine Network sent or sent hosted an amazing festival um and it was called the Love life and loss oh wait i haven't mm -hmm. lost life and love i have it right next to me um, yeah. i have a poster on the wall um and uh it was an amazing festival reimagine focuses on holding space for um people in the end of life space to hold events and talk and and they're quite amazing and powerful so they held this festival invited us to debut our film there we are so grateful and honored and flattered and we Elizabeth and I, you know, we are, we're two moving ladies. We packed our bags and went down to LA. Uh, we walked into Lamert Park, which is a historical black community in right outside of Inglewood or in Inglewood. It's right, right there. Um, like, yeah, right between downtown LA and, and Inglewood. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that was my first time there. Uh, my husband has been there quite a few times and he was so jealous that he didn't get to come because um, <laughs> he, and he told, so it was my first time and he told me, he said, honey, you are going to be walking into one of the richest examples of our culture that you will ever get to experience. Mm -hmm. And it was so true. Um, for me, it was just, I mean, soul awakening, but the community and the culture that has been captured and preserved of just authentically our culture, authentically how we have, we are shamelessly loud and vibrant and and full of life and it was just beautiful to be there especially because everyone who was there at this festival or who were presenting or hosting or doing something at the festival they're all working in the end of life space so it was really magical to be talking about something that traditionally has a taint of morbidity and sadness and uh, and then you're in such a lively place it was um awesome uh, and I don't mean awesome like yeah. oh, awesome I mean awesome like it was <laughs> just it was bold um and I think that our film was received very well again the same thing happened that Elizabeth told you about about people coming up afterwards oh I had a you know I had a situation I had a story I have um so we had great conversation after the film um people were talking and talking and talking to us I remember at one point I looked across the room at Elizabeth we had been up the whole day trying to make sure everything went you know good I think I looked at her and I was like I need food like you know like it never that we want to end conversations but it was just so much um so much connection right and genuine connection and that's also what this is really about is is connecting human to human and remembering that even though we might look different or have conversations different we're all we're all right here you know we're yeah we all kind of have the same goal in mind and the same mm -hmm. heart connections it just reinforces the the beauty of having a shorter film so there's plenty of time I mean the film is powerful and evocative it makes an impact in a short time but then people have energy <laughs> and mm -hmm. time and inspiration to talk afterwards for these conversations to take place. And that's, yeah, that's ideal. Yes. Yeah, it really is. It really is. I felt like that was the perfect place to, um, to present re or re present honoring choices to the world. Mm -hmm. I really felt like it was, it was just such a vibrant platform. Um, and, and also really backed up our message of these conversations don't have to be sad and and dismal you know they they can be approached in a different light yeah so. well as someone who has been part of the hospice world and seeing yeah. now that hospice is coming to terms with the racial disparities in care that's being offered and mm -hmm. and obviously the recognition is we we need to have conversations with people and we need to encourage 
communities to to open up these conversations. My dream is that honoring choices would become a tool that that hospices might even use in their own communities, like sponsor the film, screen it in your community, have the discussion and the conversation. If you really want to move the needle, um, encouraging people to be more open to hospice, we've got to start somewhere with, with conversations at the very least. And I think it's an ideal teaching tool. And I'm sure you won't disagree with me on that, but <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're, and we're excited to share it that way too. Um, we've, we've priced it so that it's, uh, you know, uh, a modest amount of licensing fee and that people can use it. We have moderators that we can recommend or they can talk about themselves. It doesn't really need a, you know, a certified person, um, although it's kind of nice to have someone with some experience in it. But, um, but you can also just watch the film and, and talk it amongst your family or your community. Uh, and certainly lovely to do it among hospice workers. So. Absolutely. And end of life, there's an end of life uh, doula organizations that we would like to offer this to as well. Yeah, we're not into making money. Well, we're a nonprofit, so we're not going to make money. But we, we would like to be able to offer it to as many organizations as would like it. And, and if the fee is a problem, we can make some adjustments as well. Because that's, like I said, it's not about the money. It's, it's about being able to share the story. Uh, we would like to make some, we have been approached actually about making some other films. So, you know, we do want to uh, keep our options open there. So, um, but yes, if they come to the website or contact you or us, uh, we can give them all kinds of information about the program and how to license it. Does it work? Would you say, would it work online to like have a screening of the film on online for Zoom, uh, over Zoom, say if people couldn't, weren't able to get together in one physical place and then have a Zoom discussion about it afterwards? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. It's, it's, um, it's a video link that can be downloaded and, and shared that way. That's actually fine. Yes. So Hallie, I know you're working right on the marketing and the outreach for the film. Any, like, what, um, what, what are your next steps? What do you have in mind? What, what are you working towards? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, with marketing, the next steps never stop. It's like an endless staircase. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, um, so we are doing exactly what Elizabeth said. I mean, we have, we have offered it, it is available for licensing. So if you are someone who's interested in that or being a sponsor of the film, again, go to our website. Okay. Disclaimer, everything I'm about to say, the answer is go to our website, but <laughs> um, if you're a sponsor who is, who's interested, come to our website. We do have sponsorship, some um, information available on the site, but you can absolutely reach out through the contact form and I am the magic wizard behind the form. So um, <laughs> it will get sent, sent to me and we'll get you all the information you need. Um, additionally, the, um, we are, we, we've been talking about how we can shed a little bit more about the film to listeners, followers, you know, people who are interested without giving it away. And this is like the fun puzzle piecing part of it for me as a marketing person, because you're like, okay, this film is like 18 minutes long. I don't want to just give away the ending. I don't want to, you know, tell them everything, but I want them to know about the characters. I want them to know about the plot. I want them to understand why they should even want to you know, watch this or um, sponsor that, you know, so that's always interesting for me to tackle. Um, and then additionally, um, we, this is a little bit of a shameless, like you can donate to us, but also for us to keep producing such rich content and really transformative films and conversations, uh, we do have a donation page on our website. And that is very, very helpful for us because making a film is expensive and getting good actors and um elizabeth puts in so many hours just making sure i mean like crazy she'll text me at two in the morning i'm like or email me and i'm like how is she awake right like <laughs> and, and it takes a it takes a lot of just fine tuning and um and so your donation is very much appreciated at grief dialogues um because then we can put it towards doing this and maintaining it and sustaining it and that makes it worth it for us it makes it a little a little helpful 
Definitely. Um, and I'd encourage everyone to go, go to the grief dialogues.com website and check that out and how they right. can support the work that you're doing. And then I know in the intro, I read that honoring choices is an official selection of the legacy film festival yeah. on aging in 2023. That's amazing. W where will that be held? So far, I the information that we've received is that it's going to be online this year. Oh, uh, it's going to be virtual. They have actually told us that this week they might give us an update on if that's changing or not. But so far, it's virtual. Um, it's going to be in January, I believe. And we're super excited because we got word, I think, as we were headed to the airport leaving L.A., mm -hmm. And we were just on a high because we were like, oh, that was the best festival ever. We did it. We did it. We finally debuted the film. We did it. And then we got an email. Ding. And it was like, you've been accepted. And we were like, no way. So oh, wow. Um, we're excited to share more information about that as soon as we get just a little bit more. And definitely you'll see me post about it. And then are you interested in applying to other film festivals? We're actually doing that uh, regularly now. Uh, it's film festival season. It is. So and we are members of Film Freeway, so we get uh, we get notifications when short films or, or um, festivals are opening there for their application process. So we are we are definitely applying. My very first film, I didn't write it; I was just executive producer. But the first film was 8 A.M. It's about traumatic loss, and um, it did win 13 different screenings of four film festivals sure across did. the country and in Australia. Wow. So, and it gets, wow. it's a great way to get out information uh, too. So, so, uh, and Wasn't I do want to give a Alaska shout out. Airlines for a while? It, it was on, uh, chosen yeah. by Alaska Airlines for oh, their wow. online entertainment for a month. I uh, have no idea if anybody actually watched it, but, but, and I do want to do a shout out. Compassion and Choices ha is um, our, our uh, corporate organizational sponsor on the film. So they're actually going to be showing it a number of their, or, their events. Um, and I don't know if it would help. To, would would you like me to read the film synopsis? Oh, so that's a great know? idea. Yeah, why don't you? So, that's a good idea. Um, when Bob, Denise, and Maggie's elderly father receive a terminal diagnosis, the sisters encourage him to prepare his end-of-life care plan. But Bob wants nothing to do with it. Throw in some family dynamics, disagreements, and resentments, plus a healthy dose of stubbornness and the scene changes dramatically when Bob is hospitalized. So that's the premise of the story and you have to watch it to find out what happens next. <laughs> Excellent. No spoiler alerts here. No spoiler <laughs> alerts. That's, that's, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's a, it's a great story. It's simple. And as we said before, it's universal. It's one that plays out in, most families eventually. And so, but uh, it does give you a lot to think and talk about. And I think it's great when people can, you can identify, you can see yourself in one or, or more than one of the characters. And that also lets you talk about, oh, what would I do if I were in that situation? How would I handle it? Totally. Exactly. Exactly. That's why we do this. <laughs> Well, um, I like to use this podcast as a way of spreading the word about really good things that are out there <laughs> in our field well, thank you. and <laughs> honoring choices is one of those things. So I just want to put like plant little seeds in people's minds. Think about what your community needs and maybe you could be part of an event in your community and bring the film there. Maybe you could encourage a local hospice to bring it in or some mm -hmm. other organization in your community. Have your own little mm -hmm. festival when, um, where, where you show films like this and mm -hmm. um, make donations, but also anyone who's connected with a film festival. It sounds like, is that helpful mm -hmm. if you have like a little in here and there with film festivals? To Absolutely. Get um, film? Actually, the, the Legacy Film Festival was because I gave a talk uh, on out of illness comes art. And I was on a podcast for that. Uh, and someone in the audience heard when I talked a little bit about honoring choices someone in the audience was involved with this festival and she reached out to us so yes if there's somebody out there has any kind of connections in the film world please let us know yes 
Mm, fantastic. Well, maybe one last thing before we go, just tell us quickly about your podcast, because we might as well get people listening to your podcast too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hallie, you take it away. Oh my goodness. So uh, our podcast is so much fun. Um, and that's kind of ironic. I say that because we're talking about grief. Um, but our podcast is called Out of Grief Comes Art. And it's just a podcast to um, share other artist stories. Um, and you know, some of these artists, quote unquote, I use that term loosely, do not consider themselves artists. They are someone who had a grief story or have a grief story. And they figured out, you know, I got to do something about this grief that's sitting inside of me. And so I have taken up this, or I have started doing this, or I really felt a pull to start painting. I mean, we have some really incredible people. Uh, some of these people, I am blown away that we were able to to land, but not also not a surprise because Elizabeth kind of like knows everyone, but, but oh, no. um, <laughs> she just knows she's awesome. She just has these great connections or makes great connections. And then somehow just we got really lucky and we th this season we've had we're on 22 episodes um and we have guests that are just beautiful people uh and i think anybody who listens to our podcast no matter your demographic old young black white you know whoever will will have somebody on our podcast series that they could relate to or connect with. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about our series is that we're not just talking to 50 year olds who have had 50 years of life experience and are like, we're, you know, we're talking to all ages and all everyone. So um, it's really interesting to all come together and, and all be in agreement that grief sucks and that there are things you can do. So I love it. Right. Well, as a podcaster, I'm I'm all all in favor of podcasts because it's such a great way of telling stories and sharing the word with other people. And so I'm I'm just so excited that you're doing it. And so I encourage people also to listen to Out of Grief Comes Art podcast, but be sure you go to griefdialogues.com, learn more about honoring choices. But Elizabeth, you're doing so much. There's just much yeah. more to learn oh. about on the website. We only focused in yeah. on these areas today, but yeah. you're you're doing a lot with grief dialogues yeah. too. So we'll have to have another conversation one day about Absolutely. everything else. Absolutely. I'd love I love talking with you, Karen. Thank you so much for having us on your show. Oh, you're welcome. It's been so much fun. And Hallie, I'm so glad that I got to know you and oh, um that you. you're what a great team you two are. You uh <laughs> I just feel the we flow complement between each other. You, you do. You <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, I'm so honored that I get to work with Elizabeth and that she puts up with oh. my crazy. And, <laughs> but she's really, truly um, just such a talented person and such a warm hearted person. And so getting to do this with her makes, you know, it's not, it, it's not even work, you know? Yeah. So, oh, that's nice. so, yeah. Well, the feeling is mutual and it's nice to be working with someone who's young and energetic and not that I'm old and not, but you know, well, you know, Karen, after a while, your light kind of dims a little bit, but then after doing, like we just did a podcast, Sally and I, with uh, one very talented writer. Anyway, just, you know, I feel like my, my light got a little bit brighter working with Hallie today. So it's very mutual. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Yeah. And there's, there's a great synergy when we come together and bring our energies mm -hmm. together for a common mission and cause. So absolutely. Exactly. So I'm happy I got to come together with the two of you today. And, and exactly. I, I know we're going to talk again, because there's going to be more, yeah. more news for us to share and more good things in the work you're doing. So thanks Absolutely. again. Okay, well, thank you, Karen. You're so welcome. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Elizabeth Copeland and Hallie Williams, all about the short film Honoring Choices and how it can be used in communities like yours to help encourage end of life conversations, particularly in diverse populations of people where we're trying to really move the needle on disparities in healthcare at the end of life. So I hope you'll find a way to bring Honoring Choices into your community and be sure and tune in next time for the next video. And until then, bye-bye.